I'm George Curtis. Welcome to It's Your Environment. It's my privilege to bring you shows every week where we talk to people who tell us about our environment, what we've been doing wrong with it for the last 200 years, and how we can reverse the process. Today we're at a very special place. We're on the west shore of Butamore, Terrell Island. There's a great project going, and it's probably 15 minutes from where you live. Let's get some guests to tell you about it. My first guest is Art. Welcome to the show. Thank you, George. <laughs> You've got a whole section of the local museum uh, dedicated to the efforts of Art Teclo. Tell us just briefly about that. Well, it's more dedicated to the efforts of the waterway and restoration and how the waterway is used. But um, this whole project at Terrells Island developed about 30 years ago when we developed the management plan with the people that use the system, the public, the stakeholders. and. One of the things that was of concern to them was the loss of habitat and associated fish and wildlife. So obviously the, the way to rectify that is to create new habitat, restore some of what was lost. And here, we did that at this project at Terrells Island starting in the 90s. We took an area that was historically a wetland, about almost a square mile, about 600 acres, and we basically took, it was open water, we had lost a lot of marsh, the vegetation was gone, the fish and wildlife disappeared. We took a big break wall, a rock break wall, about two miles long, and encircled that area of about 600 acres. And what we did with that break wall, the idea was to break down wave action so you don't get sediment resuspension in muddy water, and to keep the turbidity of the upper Fox River out. Basically create a giant settling basin. The water clears up, sunlight penetrates to the bottom in that shallow water the native plants come back and the fish and wildlife come back, the desirable fish and wildlife. Well, the impression I have is that this area had deteriorated over the years from the standpoint of the fish and the wildlife. Yes. What caused that deterioration? Initially, that was, that, was, that was started in way back, you go way back to the 1850s when two dams were installed on the twin outlets of, of uh, Lake Winnebago, the Lower Fox River, the Nina Dam and the Menasha Dam. Those raised the water levels initially about two, two and a half feet, and then subsequent modifications on those dams raised it another half of it. So the water level historically out here was three feet lower than it is now. And when you've got a lake like Lake Butamore that's only nine feet deep at its maximum, that was only six feet deep at that time. That's a shallow marsh or deep marsh, an open water plant community environment, completely vegetated but with not solid marsh, but aquatic, submergent aquatic plants as well a great abundance and diversity of plant species and hence a great abundance and diversity of fish and wildlife. That initial water level rise caused a lot of those emergent marshes to just literally float up and disappear and it caused, um, when that happened, the, the lake bed was exposed, waves would stir up the bottom, the water got cloudier and then the submergent plants started disappearing too, the ones that grow in deeper water up to the water surface, they couldn't get adequate sunlight penetration so the whole thing started a vicious cycle. Now water levels are still a problem, but primarily it's water clarity. We just can't get the clear water anymore because we don't have those rooted plants out there that actually create and protect water quality. In addition to the quality of the water, of what importance are these plants in terms of uh, waterfowl reproduction, fish and things like that? Well, a lot of um, fish in particular, at least from when you look at panfish, perch, bluegills, crappies, you look at largemouth bass, you look at northern pike, a significant part of their life cycle involves aquatic vegetation, whether it's to, to spawn in, to have cover for the, the fry, the little fish, or for the, to go and, and find food to forage for, for fish. So a lot of those warm water fish species require those wetland plants at some part of their life cycle. And when you look at things like waterfowl, you, and when you look at waterfowl broods, you need good aquatic plants that harbor food, small insects and things like that, protein for those, those small ducks to grow, and you need, you need that good brood water out there. And then of course you've got the fur-bearing animals like muskrats and, and mink. So vegetation, aquatic plants, not only they provide, provide water quality benefits, they buffer the shoreline, um, from erosion and they, they attenuate wave action, but they're very important at some point for a lot of, lot of good critters out there, spawning sites, food, cover, you name it. And right now we're at a site of about 1,200 acres. Yes. And uh, some people must have decided that they were going to 
unite and put some money, effort, and expertise and reverse that whole process. And it's been quite a project, hasn't it? It has. And um, with, when, when we developed what's called the Winnebago Comprehensive Management Plan in, in the mid-1980s, um, we, we spoke to a lot of groups, my, my colleagues and I, and we met a lot of citizens. And we met some citizens in Butamore. And lo and behold, there was a, a, a little offshoot of the Butamore Lions Club that formed the Butamore Conservation Club way back 20 years ago exactly to further restoration and protection efforts on Lake Butamore. And that's what this is all about. They can speak to that more, but uh, the club actually acquired this property about 15 years ago. That's a good breaking off point, Art. Uh, thank you for the background. And we're going to get Joe Yana up here and he'll tell us a little bit about how the club stepped in. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, Welcome back to It's Your Environment. I'm George Curtis, mm -hmm. and our next guest is Joe Yana. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks, George. Good to see you. I've known Joe for a long time because uh, he was a family court commissioner here in the court system of Winnebago County, and now he's retired, but in talking to him, he's not really retired. What are some of the things you're doing? Oh, all kinds of stuff. We have a Lions Club, the Conservation Club in Butamore. We just formed a new historical society in Butamore, which has a very rich history started as a fur trading post in 1818 by a gentleman named Augustine Greeno, whose name is well known in, in the area and up the valley. And I'm also involved in the Heroin Task Force and a number of other projects in the community. Well, one of them is this Terrell Island project. It is. And this is an amazing property, and it wouldn't have worked without involving many people, maybe hundreds of people. Tell us how it came about. Well, a very interesting story. Uh, in the early 1980s, the DNR uh, put together the Winnebago Comprehensive Management Plan, which was designed to create some restoration projects in Lake Winnebago and the upriver lakes because of the destruction uh, caused by the increase in the water levels by the dam and the needs of the paper companies to have more water power for their mills. Uh, the destruction was quite massive, and uh, as a result, we've got kind of a lake out here that's a lake that used to be a marsh, and a lot of the habitat has disappeared. Um, one day about 15 or 16 years ago, some gentleman from the local watering hole three doors down from me in Butamore came down and said, hey, we'd like to form a conservation club. What do you think? I said, fine. Uh, I know how to do the paperwork, so I'll help you out. So we put the paperwork together and signed it and had a bunch of meetings. and and uh, had a couple projects like putting signs in the cane beds to keep boaters and fishermen out of there because of the destruction of the cane beds and things like that. And all of a sudden the DNR hooked up with us a little bit. Uh, Ron Bruck, who is the uh, Winnebago Comprehensive Management Manager and, and Art here that you've interviewed previously, uh, came to our meetings and said, did you know the Malinsky property is for sale across the lake? Well, no, we didn't. Well, um, we want you to buy it. And I said, well, fine, how much is it gonna cost? $500,000, oh good, we'll pass the hat, right? <laughs> well, no, uh, basically at that point, they were looking for somebody to help them with the project, and we had a lot of people in the club at that time. You know, we had 100 people or more in the club at that time. We wanted to, to help out, and so a bunch of uh, protect lake protection and stewardship grants were put together by the DNR, and uh, they were able to put some funding together to help us acquire this property. And uh, we've, we've owned it for the last 15 years and uh, became part of this project, the Terrells Island Project, which is the old Molinsky farm uh, and hunting area that they used. And so we've been uh, joining together with the DNR to put this project together. We almost didn't get it. We were $100,000 short two days before the closing. We got an anonymous donor for $100,000, wow. which is an interesting story. So there's really a strong force in the community to try to, to keep this uh, environment going, this environment, environmental restoration going. And so there's a lot of support in the community. We need more support. We need more members to our club, incidentally. If uh, you're out there and you're looking for a good way to spend some of your evenings, evenings and some of your weekend days out here helping us with the various project, projects we've got going, uh, go to our website, which is bdmcc.org, and uh, check us out and uh, look at all the videos and everything else we've got on the website and come on out here and join us for a meeting. Our meetings are the, are the first Mondays of the, of the month. 
uh, and you month. meet out here at the clubhouse where we are during the good weather during the bad weather we uh, will meet at the Lions Club or uh, one of the other uh, uh, restaurants in the community now this particular property in a sense belongs to the Conservation Club It does we are titled with the property but it is really in a public trust Yes, basically it's a joint project, uh, if you want to call it, for lack of a better term, a public-private partnership, where the private uh, conservation club kind of owns the property but joins in concert with the Department of Natural Resources in managing the restoration habitat part of it. We are not, you don't have the expertise that the DNR has in terms of biology and botany and all the other sciences that are necessary to manage this property and, and hydraulics and everything else that go into to managing it effectively. So they do most of the, of the uh, technical work and we, we help them out with what we can. Uh, for example, a number of years ago there was a problem with purple loosestrife, which is a terrible invasive weed that gets in and crowds out all of the other plants uh, that, are, that are beneficial to maintaining the environment. And, uh, the DNR pointed us to uh, uh, some larvae for uh, a, a bug that is uh, produced in Australia, I think it is, and we learned how to produce that, uh, that bug and hatch the larvae, and we proliferated them here out here, and it completely ate all the uh, purple wow. loosestrife. So. Well, in short, the club pulled together, yep. raised money, they continue to offer their services out here. Correct. It really is for the benefit of everybody. It is. At, but it's a continuing effort, and you need more support, yes. more money, more members, and more people donating time. People yeah. like Joe Yana, thanks we, for being on the show. Thank you. Welcome back to It's Your Environment. I'm George Curtis, and we have a new guest. His name is Steve Schrage. Welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Now, you're with the DNR. Tell us about your responsibility. Yeah, with this project, I was the assigned project manager for this project, and it was my task to get the breakwall trail um, completed for hiking and biking and outdoor activities. Well, you know, I've heard about this breakwall. And until I saw it just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had no real concept of how significant and how involved the construction job was. Describe it to the people. Well, when we started this in 2011, there was, um, the rock was out there, but it was big, large rocks, jagged, you could not walk on them. So we decided that it would be a great idea to get people out here and really enjoy the property, see the environment, see what progress we've done out here and do that by letting people uh, walk on it. So we put together some plans, um, uh, construction plans, documents, all that and bid it out and we uh, started construction in 2012 and went into 2013 and uh, basically we put a cap on top of the big stones with finer stones and made a real nice hiking surface out here. Oh, that's an understatement. People are coming out here every day to enjoy, what is it, about three mile long hike? Yeah, if you, it's a complete loop and uh, it's 3.7 miles from um, the parking lot back to the parking lot. And uh, you got about two miles where you're completely out in the lake on both sides of you. And you get a beautiful view, not only of the lake, but if you look to the north, you see the village of Butamore. If you look to the east, you see the traffic going across the Butamore Bridge and just a lot of water and natural looking marsh. It's, it's just amazing. Five minutes from Amro, 10 minutes from Oshkosh, we have this all right here. Yeah, this is just a wonderful place to come out and enjoy. I've come out here on my own time and I think every time I've came out here I've saw deer that almost walk right up to you and ducks and geese and everything right out there not more than 15, 20 feet away. It's just a wonderful place to come out and enjoy and I'm really happy I got to be a part of this project. Well I think you're a big part of the project and it's absolutely amazing. People can come out here, what is it, an hour before? sunrise until an hour after sunset and as long as they obey the rules they can fish they can hike take pictures see wildlife uh, almost everything yep you see people on bikes out here yeah i ride my bike out here once a month um, it's a great quick four mile uh, run on the bike and you don't have a concept of how significant this construction is until you hike it 
it, it's just amazing to take more than a three mile hike out into the lake and you're seeing uh, boats on the lake part uh, to the north and to the east and on the inside this encompasses a real wildlife area for nesting for fish uh, for reconstituting the bogs and you can see some good conservation thinking at work can't you yeah absolutely and like you said to really put in perspective when we did this um, on paper it didn't look very big but when we started construction it turned into a really big project and it was it took a lot longer than we hoped but we got it done on time within budget and uh, it turned out great well when people come out here uh, they're going to see the lake they're going to see this enclosed area by the break wall. They're going to see nature trails. And they're going to see marsh. They'll see, I don't know how many varieties of birds. Next time I come, I'm bringing my bird book. Uh, give them an idea of what kind of wildlife they're going to see out here. Well, you're going to see, uh, it depends on what part of the trail you're on. Um, there's about two miles that are out into the lake. And you're going to see a lot of uh, ducks, waterfall, um, more of that out in the lake and then once you get to shore you're gonna see a lot of shoreline birds there's great blue herons all over there's um, red-headed blackbirds marsh wrens um, all kinds of and how about mammals mammals there's obviously there's deer I talked about that a little bit ago I see a lot of deer out here and um, there's uh, I see uh, muskrats and um, Boy, okay, there's quite so a few. Bring a camera, uh, bring some walking shoes, a sketch pad, a little bit for the weather, and whether you're going to bring a fishing rod or, or whether you're just going to read a book or go for a hike, uh, you, you, you're going to see all of it. And uh, really, how do people get here? It's so simple. Oh, you just take Highway 21 and um, you turn north on Riverview Ro Rivermore Road and you follow it down and you follow the signs to say Trails Island Breakwall. You follow the trail in and there's a really nice parking lot there and it has, there's maps in the parking lot, all the rules and um, everything you need to get going. Well, that's absolutely true. Highway 21, most people in this area are familiar with the drop zone where Bill Hassenfuss trains people to jump out of airplanes yep. and have their chutes open. That's where you turn north. It's about three miles north on Rivermore, and then is it Schubert Road uh, to the east? Yep. And that's just a short jaunt, takes you right to the parking lot. It's user friendly. Uh, there is information there that you can take, tell you what you want to go looking for. A wonderful way to spend a nice day. Yep. And it belongs to all of us. Yeah, it's open to the public, and uh, it's just a great partnership that we have with the Butamore Conservation Club to make a great projects like this possible. I didn't know the DNR could be so co cooperative. We are always very cooperative. <laughs> Steve, thank Thanks, you very George. much. Welcome back to Terrell Island. I'm George Curtis, and we have somebody who does hands-on, everyday caretaking to this wonderful park. His name is Pete Kuchenberg. Welcome. You took Ron Bullock, our producer, and my wife, Suzette, and me on a nice trip a couple of weeks ago that just boogled our minds. Uh, I had no idea of the immensity of this project, how much work, thought, and money went into it, and the efforts that have to be made daily to keep it as pristine as it is. Tell us about your part in the project. Well, I manage the grounds out here, and I have a little help during the summer. I get, uh, we have an intern this year, so a lady, uh, she's a college last year of college and she mows the lawns and, and helps me with different things, the weed control and and uh, we do uh, we do not daily but uh, I, I try to do it three two, two or three times a week. We do a clean up on the entire trail, clean up uh, any garbage, anything, uh, cans, uh, anything people leave behind and anything the birds leave behind, <clears throat> like dead fish and et cetera, et cetera. So. Well, people are invited to bring their animals along, but they have to be on a leash. And if the animal leaves the deposit, they're supposed to pick up the deposit. Correct. We furnish bo uh, bags at the entrances. And, and you have uh, areas where if they have some paper from their lunch or something like that, they're supposed to deposit it. So we don't have a mess on this trail anytime I've been out here. 
No, but I do occasionally. Okay, uh, and that's part of your job to encourage people to be clean but pick yes. up when they're not clean. Yep. Yep. Now you've got three trails, three different trails. Can you describe the difference between them? Uh, well, so we have the main trail and that includes a break wall and it, it, it's 3.8 miles. It makes a complete circle back to the parking lot regardless of which gate you go, either from the Caker Trail or from the, the, this side. So uh, it doesn't matter which way you go. If you go out the Caker Trail by the barn, you get out on the water quicker than if you come out by the Clubhouse Trail. We also have, from the parking lot, there's a, a wood bridge that it, it's actually a rustic trail, and I mow that occasionally. Um, it's, uh, it dead ends out near the what we call the orchard, the old orchard, and that's a one-way trail. In other words, you, when it dead ends, you got to go back the way you came. And then uh, we have another rustic trail that is is out about a block and a half from the parking lot, from the main trail, and that goes along an old dredge bank, and that actually makes a circle and comes back into the parking lot, and that's very rustic. So people have a choice as to what kind of walk they want to bite off. Yes. If somebody uh, is going to spend Sunday afternoon with the baby and the buggy, they probably want to uh, stick with the brake wall. Yes, and the brake wall ha is uh, wheelchair accessible, and there's been people that have been out here that are handicapped with those motorized scooters, and they've made the complete 3.8 miles with the scooters. Well, good for them. Uh, yes. th that's a, quite a hike. Yeah. Uh, and uh, how about times of the year? Do people use this in the winter as well? Uh, it's we don't plow it during the winter, so it's sometimes I, I've got to plow my four wheeler, uh, my personal four wheeler, and I sometimes plow a path out, uh, maybe a block or two out on the trail from the parking lot, so people can walk their dogs and they can do their thing. But uh, we have a tremendous amount of wind out here, and it's open, and it, these. These uh, areas drift shut so quick, it's just unbelievable. So you have people of all ages and all levels of health and physical conditioning that can find something to do out here besides yeah. just enjoying the scenery. Yeah. And you, you've got the lake on two sides. Yep. And uh, you, you've got the area inside the breakwater where there are so many birds, maybe too many birds. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and a carp block of some sort. What's the purpose of that? Uh, we have a carp gate. Uh, the intent of that is, is to keep the spawning carp out uh, in the springtime and that carp gate stays up where you can pull your boat over the top so you can still have access um, with a boat. And then in the fall before ice up, we, we push the gate down and we have a mechanism where we hold it down under the water about three feet and that is uh, so we don't have ice damage. And we want to keep the carp out because they damage these important plants that our tech yes. was telling us about. Yes. And it's amazing. This is slowly getting back to the quality of the environment that was here a hundred years ago before people ruined it. Yes, I'd say so. Thanks to dedicated people, and you're one of them, Pete. We thank you very much for what you're doing for all of us. Thank you. And thanks for being on the show. Welcome back to It's Your Environment. We've moved inside to our studios at 491 South Washburn in Oshkosh in a building with my law offices and a whole lot of radio stations. But we've got our guest, Art Teclo, here. Art, welcome back to the show. Thank you, George. Apparently, when we plan things as they were so well planned in the Terrell Island project mm -hmm. uh, with cooperation between the state, the feds, the scientists, the locals, and all of that put together, it was a great plan. But sometimes Mother Nature doesn't follow the script. Tell us what happened this time. Well, when we wrapped up Terrells Island as a completed project in about 1997, we had a, a finished break wall encircling a large area of about 600 acres of water. We put a carp barrier in in 1988. There's only one entrance through that break wall by water. We put a carp barrier in there with a navigable gate, kept the carp out, carp out and we saw an instant response in the, in the water clarity improving, the plant life coming back, and the associated desirable fish and wildlife following. And it was just gorgeous, fabulous area. The water clarity was pristine. The fisheries was coming back. It came back, in fact, and it was in the, in the migratory waterfowl, and everything like that. It was just beautiful. And that persisted through the mid-2000s, and I thought, this is just too good to be true. And you know how that story behind that is. So 
the one wild card in there that we didn't ever anticipate and wasn't even a factor at the time we started this project was the American white pelican and to some extent the double crested cormorant. Now people are familiar with those birds now but there weren't even pelicans around back then. Well we attracted a really nice spot for them to forage and also the nest because we had constructed some nesting islands in there for, for waterfowl and those birds literally took over. In 2005 I, I discovered the first pelican nest, probably doc, the first documented nest in Winnebago County. 13 nests in 2005. By 2010 that number had gone to 1400 and the cormorants joined them. So basically we had thousands of these water birds which aren't a nuisance unto themselves until they get into high densities. Thousands of these water birds literally living inside there, inside that break wall area from April through October and because of their, that density in that small area, you know, we've got thousands of birds in 600 acres, the droppings, the bird guano from those birds created such fertility that the water clarity dropped because we had algae blooms in there. The water clarity started to drop. The sunlight penetration was no longer adequate to get the plants growing. The plant community collapsed. The fish and wildlife collapsed. The few carp that were in there, and you can't ever keep carp out, the few that were in there got the upper hand with the turbid water. Now, and you've seen it the other day when you took a walk out there, now the water clarity, there's no difference between the inside, the break wall, and the main lake. So we've got basically a carp filled basin with turbid water and we lost our desirable fish and wildlife and we have to turn that around. How do we do that? We've started working on reducing the bird numbers overall. We built a trail on the break wall. The, the primary reason was to build a hiking trail but the secondary benefit is to keep peop is, is people. Human disturbance is going to keep those nuisance birds or that nuisance level of birds off that break wall. Um, we reduced the island profile to the point where they're underwater during the nesting season. We're trying to plant emergent plants like bulrush and phragmites and things like that on there. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, their, their animal plant con um, health inspection service is controlling cormorants actively and oiling eggs and nests. So we're reducing the overall numbers of birds. And then the next big step is we're going to go after the carp with a, a, a compound called rotenone. It's toxic to anything with gills. It's naturally occurring in the root of a South American plant. It's expensive and we've got to lay this out to where we've got one chance after we get the bird numbers reduced we're going to go after the carp. Very few other fish in there that are desirable and we're going to eliminate everything and start over. How long is it going to take? I would say that probably this is going to be a two-year process at least. Starting, just restarting, it's probably going to be a several-year process and we're midway through it but the big things are coming up with the carp control. So all that work, all that money, all that effort, 10 steps forward, three steps back, now we're ready to go forward again. Yep, yep, and we saw the potential out there. We have a lot of time and effort and, and dollars invested in it. It's well worth it. We've seen the potential, what we have. We had a reversal and we're gonna turn it back around. And people are encouraged to go out there and watch the progress? Yes, absolutely. Join, contribute, participate, comment. It belongs to everybody. Absolutely. That's Thank you for. for your good work. Thank you. We'll be right back. Well, every time we try to fool Mother Nature, she shows her independent streak. We learned a lot with Hork and Marsh, where we tried to drain it, burn it, make it into a great big artificial lake. And now we're pretty much back where Mother Nature had it before. We've spent millions of dollars and uh, lots and lots of time and Mother Nature had the trump card. We're getting better at it. We now have professionals like Art Teclo and we are going along with Mother Nature's plan but carefully. Every once in a while we have a misstep and we pay for it. What's the lesson? Don't fight Mother Nature ask her to dance and let her lead. That's my opinion. I'm George Curtis.